Welcome back. In this part of the mini course on reinforcement learning with human feedback or RLHF, we study a particular RL method called proximal policy optimization or PPO. This is used in fine tuning language models such as ChatGPT. In the first lecture, we will cover the theory behind PPO. And in the second lecture, we implement PPO following the theory lecture step by step. We mentioned theoretical reasoning behind each of the steps, but our main focus is intuitive understanding of the material. These lectures are specifically designed for language fine tuning in mind, but one can use them to learn PPO for general purpose reinforcement learning problems as well. What is PPO? Proximal policy optimization or PPO is a strong method in solving reinforcement learning problems such as the one you see on the screen. It can be used to solve Atari games and classical control problems, but it is also capable of solving more complex problems such as robotic hand control in real world or a game as complex as Dota 2. This is the default reinforcement learning method used at OpenAI. Of course, for more complex problems, different versions are developed, but they all share the base idea of PPO. It is also the method used to fine tune language models through reinforcement learning with human feedback or RLHF. We will learn both the theory and implementation of a baseline PPO. This baseline will be flexible enough for more complex situations if needed. Before we go over how to use the course, let me provide you with the level of the course. This course is an advanced course. So I'm expecting you to be familiar with machine learning concepts at at least intermediate level, meaning that I'm expecting you to be familiar with concepts such as entropy or maximum likelihood estimation. But if you're not familiar with these and you are a beginner, don't be afraid because I have provided you with the resources that you can go directly to the notions that you don't know and learn them in those resources. For the beginners, if you don't get all of the material right away and you don't have the energy or time to go to the resources and learn the material, I know that it's tempting that you want to jump right to the next lecture, which is the coding, but don't do that. Even if you don't get all of the material, even if you get just 25% of it, or even if you just get familiar with the notions at a very, very high level, it is still very worthwhile. And it gives you a confidence that later, when you look at the code, you will be very confident on how to change the code and modify it to your liking and according to your problem. This is the way that I suggest you to follow this course. Firstly, do not try to learn everything in one go, unless you have familiarity with RL from before. Secondly, for each of the slides that you see, first pause the slide and then listen to my explanation. It is a proven technique that learning from two modalities is more effective. Thirdly, at the beginning of this lecture, I explained the overall flow of the algorithm. Go over the flow and see what parts are new to you and focus only on learning those parts. Okay, good luck. Let us go over high level flow of the algorithm PPO. PPO has two phases, rollout creation and model update. In the rollout creation phase, we generate n trajectories using our current policy, which is called pi theta o. We calculate several uh, values, including logits, values, and advantage estimation along those trajectories using pi theta o. Don't worry if you don't know what these are, we will explain them later. Finally, we store all those quantities in the storage. And that's gonna be the end of phase one. 
in phase two, the model update, we will update the model for several epochs. So how do we update it? We first select a mini batch of samples from this storage. It's the same as storage that we created in phase one. Then we generate logits of the actions along the mini batch that we calculated, but now through the new policy phi theta. We calculate the surrogate loss along those mini batches, and then we update the model phi theta using the gradient of the loss. We repeat these steps for k epochs. After the k epochs, we update the old theta to the new theta. And that's going to be the end of phase two. After the phase two, we will go back again to phase one and we will repeat this loop again and again. We will repeat this loop until some predefined number of steps is reached or until we reach to a some target average return. And that's the proximal policy optimization method. Okay, so what is RL? In RL, we have an agent that acts on an environment. Each action changes the state of the environment and based on that, a reward is collected. This loops continue until a horizon time limit T is reached or the game is terminated. The goal is to collect the highest possible reward. Let's look at this specific example to make sense of the setup. This is a, con a classical control problem where the agent controls a card that can move left or right and the goal is to balance the pole as long as possible. Here, the agent can take its discrete set of actions with only two entries, left or right. The state of the system is defined by four real numbers. Can you guess what those four numbers are? What four numbers determine the state of the system uniquely? Pause and think. One possible answer is the location of the car, its velocity, the angle of the pole, and its angular velocity. Does that uniquely determine the state of the system? Next, what is an appropriate reward for this problem? How would you design a reward that approximate our idea of balancing the pole as long as possible? Pause and think. One possible answer is to assign plus one for every action that keeps the pole balance. This way, the longer we keep the balance, the more reward we collect. So it seems like a good idea. Note that we limit our RL setup to a level relevant to our problem. For example, we do not study more complex setups such as partially observed states or multi-agent problems. Let's make the goal more concrete. We are in a search of a policy that maximizes the reward in average. Our policy is defined through a deep neural network, hence the name DeepRL. It consumes a state S as the input and it speeds out a probability distribution over the actions. We can then sample the probability to get a specific action. We want to find a network that provides the best series of actions starting from a random state S. So we want to maximize the total expected future reward starting from any states. For example, here, this each state is defined by four real numbers that go into our small neural network. The net neural network is parameterized by the parameter theta. And for every given entry S, it speeds out a probability P for the action left and one minus P for the action right. The idea is that we want to find theta 
such that for every initial state S, the neural network creates a set of action states pairs or a trajectory in a way that this trajectory collects the highest reward. Or in other words, it balances the pole the longest possible. In math language, we have the following optimization problem. A trajectory is a set of action state pairs generated by the policy. The expectation is over all such trajectories created by our current policy pi theta. The total reward is simply the sum of all rewards collected in a trajectory. And we are interested in finding the maximum of this expectation. In practice, we usually prefer immediate rewards compared to the rewards in the distant future. The discount factor gamma is a hyperparameter to enforce this. The smaller the gamma is, the greedier the algorithm will be. It makes sense to prefer immediate rewards intuitively. Think about $10,000 now versus in five years. For those of you interested to know the theory behind it, the discount factor results in the series being absolutely convergent if individual rewards are bounded. This in turn results in compactness on the operators acting on the reward, which leads into desirable convergence property for our policy optimization. But forget about that. We will stick to the intuitive understanding of preferring immediate rewards. I recommend to pause here to fully understand the setup. This is our first thought bubble. So let me explain what these are. These are small snippets of information that their flow is usually inconsistent with the flow of the course. So sometimes they are a little bit more theoretical or sometimes they are a little bit more philosophical than the usual flow of the course. So I represent them in a kind of different format, but they are very useful all the time. And I recommend you to go over these snippets as well as the rest of the course. Central limit theorem, in my opinion, is the most important theorem in, in statistics. This is the theorem that legitimizes many of the methods in machine learning. In machine learning, we usually have an objective function and we want to optimize its expected value. We approximate the optimization by sampling the training set and optimizing the average of the batches. But why do we have any right to believe this leads into the original expected value optimization. Also, do we have any confidence level when applying this approach? This is where CLT gives us some theoretical support. So we take some samples from a distribution, we take their average, and then the average converges to a normal distribution. The fact that the sample average is an unbiased estimator of the expected value is not surprising. But the interesting part is that CLT states that no matter what the original distribution looks like, the average converges to a normal distribution. And even more interestingly, the variance is proportional to one over square root of N. This means that if the sample size increases, we will have more confidence on our results. So again, this is the theoretical enabler of a lot of machine learning that we do. Supported by central limit theorem, we can use sample average to approximate the expected value. Additionally, use estimated bounds such as Chebyshev inequality. We can even have confidence intervals. Also, CLT allows us to interchange average with expected value in our calculations. That's the main trick that we use a lot in our computations in the rest of this course. 
Another lemma that is very useful for us is this theorem. Composing a monotonic function does not change the argmin or argmax of an optimization problem. For example, take a look at the function that we have here. The blue curve is a Gaussian. Assume that that is our objective function and we want to maximize it. The location of the maximum is over here. But if I compose that function with a log function, which is a monotonic function, it will give me another function. This can be thought of our new objective. The location of the maximum of this objective is the same as the original objective, but the shape of it is much nicer because the new shape is convex while the original shape was not convex. Being convex is a good property from optimization perspective. So in short, if we compose our function with monotonic functions, or if we add or subtract something from, um, from our objective function, that's the, that does not change the location of the optimizer. And that is usually what we care about. We care about the arg mean or arg max. We do not care usually about the shape of the objective itself. So that is a very useful trick to use. Hence, this is a very useful trick. It allows us to modify our objective to simpler or computationally more efficient objectives without changing the location of the optimizer. Another trick that is similar to the one that we have studied states that if two functions have similar gradients, they behave the same locally. For example, if we have a function A over here and another function B that they have the same kind of gradient at some point, then locally around that point, they behave the same. So meaning that we can, instead of uh, working with A around that point, we can work with B if B is simpler than A. Note that as opposed to the previous lemma, this one is a local one, meaning that this is valid only in a neighborhood close to the center point. Let's look at an example. Assume that we want to maximize the probability of an observed trajectory given by S0 to ST minus one through the policy pi theta. So we want to update the parameters of the model in a way that a sample observation becomes more likely. It is essentially a maximum likelihood estimation. What do we do? Think about it. How about writing the probability of this trajectory through our policy and change the policy in a way to make that more probable? What is the probability of a trajectory through our, our policy? Pause and think. Let's look at a very simple example just to make clear why that expression is the expression of the probability. So let's say that we have only two states and only two actions, and the length of the trajectory tau is just two. Then we will have that at the beginning we have S0, the state S0. Then we might take action A1 or A2, and then we, will, we might end up with the state S0 or S1. And here again, we might end up with S0 or S1. And then here we get, again can apply action A1 or action A2 and we will be ending up either with the state S0 or S1 and similarly here S0 or S1. Now if we look at a particular trajectory over here, let's say we want to look at this trajectory over here. So we will have, at the beginning, we will have the probability of S0 times the probability of A1 
but that is given by our policy. So it's going to be the problem, the policy pi theta of a one, given that we were at this state S zero. Now, after we apply that action, the state changes, but the state also changes in a probabilistic fashion. So then it's going to be given by the probability of ending up at this state zero when we started at the state S zero and we applied the action A one. Okay. So the next chain is going to be when we are here. So the probability pi theta of A two, when we were at this state S zero, right over here, times the probability of ending up at a state S1 when we originally was at this state S0 and we applied the action A2. So this is going to be the probability of our trajectory. And as you can see over here, the items that we have are corresponding items in the in the expression that we have above. So all of them starts with probability of S0, and then we have the action that is given by pi, then multiplied by the transition probability, um, the transition of going from one state to another state. And then you multiply all of them together. So this is the expression that explains what the probability of a, tra of a particular trajectory is. Okay, we calculated the probability of a given trajectory. Now, the next goal is to find the optimizer of this. Essentially, we want to change the parameters of the pi in a way that this particular observation becomes very likely. Next, we want to apply the trick that we learned previously. So we apply the log function to our objective function. Note that we wanted to optimize this objective, but we know that the location of the optimizer doesn't change if we apply a log function to it. So applying the log function, we know that the log of the product is equal to sum of the items in the product. So by applying the log, we turn the product into summation. That's a very desirable property because if you note at the beginning that we had a product, the product is over terms that each of them is a probability term. So each of them is a smaller than one. So if the length of tau is very long, it will be a chain of many small numbers multiplied to each other. And you know that that's not going to be numerically stable because a lot a product of a lot of small numbers can end up very, very small and we might underflow. But this expression that we have over here after taking the log, it's a much more stable expression without changing the actual location of the optimizer. Next, we take the gradient of the objective function because we want to use the gradient based optimization methods. Okay, take the gradient of the expression. Can you guess what terms are going to be canceled by the gradient? Note that the gradient is with respect to theta. Pause and look at the expression. You can easily see that the terms in red do not depend on theta, so the gradient will cancel them out. So we will end up with the expression at the bottom. This is the same optimization problem at the as the original one, but it doesn't need Leibniz rule or dealing with many multiplicative terms that are uh, that is numerically unstable. And it ignores the transition probabilities of how a state changes. In short, it is a much nicer expression
to work with both computationally and analytically while it has the same underlying optimization problem. So the trick is that we can change the objective function to get to a nicer expression if we keep the gradient approximately the same. This trick is used a lot in reinforcement learning. Let's quickly review what we did. We wanted to maximize the probability of observing a specific trajectory tau. We calculated its probability and then we did some manipulation to get to the last expression that we have over here. This is a nice optimization problem now. And by optimizing it, we can maximize the probability of observing a particular trajectory tau. This is a maximum likelihood estimation. Let's remember the last expression that we have here. Also, let's remember the tricks that we used here because both of them will be repeated in the RLHF derivation. Let's go back to our RL problem. We wanted to find a policy that gives us high expected return. From here to the end of this section, we focus on the objective and manipulating it to nicer expressions, both numerically and analytically. To compute this objective, you must cover the whole search space with high resolution. This might be possible in a problem of court pool, which is a simple problem which has a four-dimensional state, but it is completely infeasible for more complex problems. Therefore, over the course of this section, we create an approximation for the original objective that has nice properties, such as being tractable computationally, being sample efficient, and being numerically stable. So buckle up and let's start. The final goal is to get to the green objective. Let's start with a much simpler problem. Consider a supervised learning problem where we have a large set of successful playthroughs of the card poll problem. For example, we can assume that these many trajectories of successful playthroughs are given to us, maybe by a human playthrough. How do we model this? Pause and think. This is the same objective optimization that we study in the first thought bubble. Instead of one trajectory, we have many of them. It tunes theta to maximize the likelihood of the observations. It also uses central limit theorem to approximate the expected value with the average. So assuming that we have good trajectories, we can learn from them in a supervised fashion by doing maximum likelihood optimization. But there is a problem here. The problem is that this approach has no idea about the effect of its action in the future. It is simply mimicking what it has seen before without considering possible challenges or opportunities. It might work in a simple problem, but in a problem with long-term dependencies, it fails. It doesn't know how to plan. Do you see why supervised learning lacks reasoning and why RL might be a remedy? If you plan for something, you need a non-trivial level of reasoning. Let's just add a term that simply calculates future projections. The advantage term of the action A at the state S explains how better or worse the action A is compared to the rest of the actions, measuring by its future expected return. So it tries to add an element of planning for future to our computations. There are more rigorous ways to derive the advantage term, but this intuition is very clear and explains the logic very well. 
likelihood objective defines how likely a trajectory is through our current policy. We want to reweight the likelihood so that the trajectories with higher than average expected return are weighted higher. So we have a new objective now, but the next challenge is how do we calculate this advantage term? In fact, we approximate the advantage term through general advantage estimation. Let's expand the advantage. The first term calculates the expected return at the state S if we take the action A. The second term calculates the expected return at the state S going through all actions. So the difference tells us how much better the action A is compared to the average. The second term does not depend on the action and it gives us how good the current state is in terms of its average return. A function that approximates the future return based on the current state is called a value function. In simple words, the value function estimates how bad or good our current state is. In practice, the value function is either another network or an extra head on top of our current policy network. The latter is the method we use, hence it is trained concurrently with the policy. Let's continue with, uh, with the advantage estimation, assuming we have a value function. Note that after taking any action, we will end up in a state. So we can take the action, collect the reward, and rather than calculating the rest of the trajectory, approximate its return with the value function. So we have multiple ways of approximating the advantage. For example, let's say that we want to stop at the second state. We have R0 plus gamma R1 plus gamma squared R2 plus gamma 3 R3 plus dot dot dot. This is going to be approximately equal to R0 plus gamma R1 plus we know that after we collected this reward, we will end up at this state S2. So rather than continuing with the series, we can approximate that with the value at S2. So the question is which of these approximation do we use and why? What are the pros and cons of each of the approximations? The terms in the series are directly calculated from the sample trajectory. So their average is an unbiased estimator of the total return. However, since the average is based on a limited number of trajectories we currently are studying, it has a very high variance. On the other hand, the value function has seen many samples, so it has less variance. Therefore, it is a bias variance trade-off. The generalized advantage estimation says to take an exponential average of all of the terms with a hyperparameter lambda that controls the bias variance trade-off. Hence, instead of picking a fixed setup, we can tune the parameter based on our problem. This is how we can think of lambda. The smaller lambda is, the better bias, but higher variance and vice versa. The sum results in a recursive formula. I skipped the calculations here because it's a standard long series manipulation that doesn't teach us much. The result is that after some manipulations, some of the terms cancel out and we can find a reverse recursive formula for the advantage term based on the sum that we had in the previous slide. At a terminal state, the advantage will be zero because there is no future step. 
we can backtrack from that terminal state to all the other states. This is a recursive formula that we have for the advantage. Note that for this to work, we need to have an accurate value function. Remember that the value function is the expected return of a given state, but we already have a sample trajectory that gives us the actual return from that state. So these two should be close, and we can use a squared error loss to train the value function. Remember this loss term as it will be one of the terms in our final loss. Okay, so we know how to calculate the advantage and we have a new approximated objective. This objective still needs improvement. Look at these two expressions that we have on the screen. The left hand side is the objective that we just calculated. Now I want to take the derivative of that objective at the point theta is equal to theta o. Let's see what will happen. So the gradient with respect to theta at the point theta o of the expression that we have. Log of prime theta a hat sub t. So expected value is a linear functional, so I can switch it with the derivative. Next, I can apply the derivative to the log function. So the derivative of u is equal to u prime over u, if you remember from calculus. Okay, now let's take a look at what I have over here. When I calculate this at the, at the point theta is equal to theta O, let me actually go over the last expression too. When I calculate this derivative at the point theta is equal to theta O, this will be exactly the derivative of the right hand side at the same point. So around that point, these expressions behave very similarly. If you remember from the gradient trick that we studied before. So we can, uh, we can switch to this new objective that is an approximation of the old objective and it behaves similarly, at least when theta and theta old are close to each other. So why do we want to even do that? It has two advantages. If we update the model as it generates new trajectories, one can see that even a single bad trajectory has a chance of throwing the model off track completely. But if we generate a large batch of trajectory first through the pi theta old and then use the average to update the model to pi theta, it has less variance and the chance of going off track decreases. Additionally, this decoupling simplifies the implementations. So this is a nice objective to work with. But there is a catch. The advantage is calculated based on the old policies and will not be valid if the new and old policies are too far from each other. So how do we make sure they are close? We can enforce closeness using two different methods. Firstly, we can use KL divergence. KL divergence is a statistical distance measuring how far two distributions are from each other. 
This method is harder to control since the beta is to be scaled according to the first term, which is changing over the training process. So it needs to be picked dynamically. You might see this method used in some implementations of RLHF. The second method is easier to work with. Epsilon is a constant between zero and one, and it determines the size of the tr trust region. The trust region is a region where the policies are close within that region. So our advantage is valid within that region. The typical value for the epsilon is 0 0.2. And we treat this as a hyperparameter. Let's look closely at the pessimistic clipping objective. This is the modification of the original expression to enforce that the updates don't shoot out of the trust region. I leave it to you to look at the diagram at the four areas and understand the details. But the final idea is simple. If the old and new policies are close, it's just the default objective. You can see that over here. It's just the previous term that we calculated. But when the results get better and these two policies are far from each other, we do a pessimistic update by clipping the objective. When the results get worse, however, we allow larger steps to undo the updates. Essentially, it's a pessimistic update of the policy. And we finally found the main PPO objective term. This is the most important term in the PPO objective. This term pushes the policy toward generating trajectories that have higher expected return. Next, we add another term to encourage the model to explore more trajectories. What is exploration versus exploitation? Imagine you are maximizing your career success. The number of things to try is large. You can stick to the first thing you found yourself good at. This is the extreme case of exploitation. Or you may keep exploring new career paths every month. This is the extreme case of exploration. Even as a human with very high general intelligence, it is a tricky problem to find a balance. Both extreme the strategies have bad results in average. Another simpler example is when you want to pick your restaurant. Exploitation says go to your favorite restaurant that you already know. And exploration says try a new restaurant that you have never tried before. It is clear that we want some level of exploration in our method. There are sophisticated methods such as upper confidence bound algorithm to deal with this dilemma. But the simplest idea is to enforce exploration by entropy and randomness in actions. Essentially, if you make sure you always have a small chance of trying something new in your action space, you give exploration opportunity to your model. This simplest setup is enough for our RLHF setup. I expect the more advanced methods to be adopted in RLHF soon. In math language, we can add a loss term that enforces entropy over the actions created by the policy. We control the strength of this loss term by a coefficient. And we finally have all the pieces of our final objective. We create n trajectories of length t by the old policy. Then we calculate the gradient of this final loss to update our model. The clip policy loss pushes the policy towards trajectories with higher expected return. 
The value loss makes our estimates of returns more accurate. And the entropy loss encourages policy to explore. Constants control the strength of each factor. Note that we want to increase the clipped objective, decrease the value function loss, and increase the entropy, hence the positive and negative signs. Okay, now we know how to calculate all of the items. We know how to calculate end trajectories using the policy pi theta O. We just sample actions along the trajectory. We also save the logits of the actions along those trajectories that we created. We also know that our model has another head that calculates the value along the trajectories. We know how to use the values and the logits and a recursive formula to find the advantages along the trajectories. So now that we know how to calculate all of these, we store them into a storage for the end trajectories. And that's going to be the rollout creation, which is phase one. In the phase two, which is model update, we repeat some updates for k epochs. For each of the updates, we select a mini batch from the storage. And we create logits along the mini batch, but this time using the new pi theta policy. After that, we can calculate uh, clipped loss because we have the advantages and we have the old logits and we have the new logits. So we know how to calculate the clipped loss. We also have values that we stored in this storage along the trajectories. And we also have the rewards along the trajectories. So we can calculate now the value function loss. Finally, the entropy loss is just the entropy of the actions which we have already stored. So we have all three components of the surrogate loss. So we can calculate the surrogate loss and we can update pi theta using the gradient of the surrogate loss. We repeat this for k epochs. At the end of the k epochs, we update theta old to be equal to the theta of the uh, pi theta policy. And that's going to be the end of phase two. At the end of phase two, we can go back again to phase one and we can repeat this loop again and again. We repeat this loop until a predefined number of steps is reached or we get to a, an average target return. And that is the proximal policy optimization method. A full in-depth guide on RL requires a complete course. For language fine-tuning, the material in this course will be enough. But I will list a more in-depth material here for anyone interested. The links are also available in the video description. While the list is complete, it is minimalist that includes only the best. Here are three levels of resources. If you are interested to understand a baseline PPO required for RLHF, this mini course should give you enough knowledge, both on the theory and implementation side. If you want to understand it in more depth, I recommend that you go over these three resources. Peter Abil course on foundation of deep RL is a great course and it's available freely on YouTube. OpenAI Spinning up documentation gives you a lot of detail about the implementation side of things. And finally, the original paper of PPO is an easy to read paper that I recommend that you read it. Finally, if you are interested 
to learn about RL for general purpose problem solving, I recommend these two resources. The classical book by Sutton and Bartow, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction, is a book that is available online freely. And also the Sergey Levine course at UC Berkeley CS285 is a great course that goes over all the details of reinforcement learning. In this course, we're gonna focus mainly on a baseline PPO required for RLHF. This can be used for many other purposes too, but the focus is language fine tuning. In the first lecture, we will study the theory behind PPO. And in the second lecture, we will go over implementation. Next lecture will be all about implementation. We take the material that we learned in this lecture and we implement them step by a step. At the end of the implementation, we apply it to a few simple problems to make sure that it works well. See you next time.